Michelle called me a little after noon and said she was on her way home. I asked her how the dance was, and she said she'd tell me about it when she got home. I'd been anxious ever since she left the day before. Today was the first day of our forced separation, and if she had an exciting story to tell me, I knew that I was in a difficult situation already. It had been five days since we were intimate, and I was already feeling very eager. I had no idea how I was going to manage the next 30 days without her, and then another 30 days, knowing she was with Brett. Michelle got home a little past four that afternoon. When she drove into our driveway, I went outside to meet her. I opened the door for her, and she got out of the car. It was obvious she'd taken the instructions from Brett seriously. She didn't hide the fact that she wasn't wearing pants. She looked very attractive. When she stood up, I started to take her in my arms and hug her. She pushed me away with the words, Honey, we can't do that. She wouldn't even let me give her a friendly kiss on the cheek. That night was the beginning of our forced separation. Brett wanted her to think she was his throughout the next month and feel incredibly eager. He hadn't explicitly said that, but it was easy to understand from his requirements. Shortly after she got home, she said she was really hungry, so we went out to dinner at the Olive Garden, and Michelle attracted attention wherever she went. I wanted her so badly but knew we couldn't be together. Nothing in the agreement said I couldn't tell her how much I loved her, though. It was difficult saying those words and not being able to hold her hand or be close to her. During dinner, I asked Michelle about the dance. I enjoyed it, she said. I guess it was a pretty normal dorm dance. We danced some, and Jeremy enjoyed showing me off to his friends. She told me she had fun playing pool like she used to in college. I didn't know you played pool in college, I told her. Yeah, when I used to go with Mike, we played quite a bit. I was actually pretty good, I was a little surprised. That was the first time she'd ever mentioned playing pool in college. I assumed that being with a college crowd had probably brought back a lot of memories. Did you win? I asked her. I won some and lost some, but I was pretty good. It's been so long since I played that most of the skill I did have was gone nothing else happened, I asked her. I couldn't believe that she hadn't at least taken Jeremy back to her room. Not much. Jeremy wanted to go to my room with me but I told him I'd been sick the last few days and was just too tired. I convinced him to dance with several of the girls his own age, and he enjoyed that. That was my goal with Jeremy anyway, so it turned out okay. Are you going to write about it? Like you did his first date, she told me. There's not a lot to write about, but I guess I could. It might be a little boring. I wondered if there was something she wasn't telling me. It doesn't seem like she'd have driven all the way to Seattle for what sounded like a pretty dull dance. I guess she didn't know how it'd turn out, and I did know she was still acting pretty tired even when she left. I hoped then that she would write about it, though. We got home a little after 10, and Michelle said she was tired after driving all afternoon. I went to bed, and Michelle joined me just a few minutes later wearing her satin pajama gown and nothing else. That's the one similar to what Ginger wore the night we were snowed in, in Pendleton. We'd always been intimate whenever she wore that gown. I knew it would be difficult lying next to her and not being intimate with her. She told me, I have to buy some new 90s tomorrow. I haven't had a chance to yet I'd forgotten about that. Michelle's agreement said she was supposed to wear new nightgowns every night new beautiful nightgowns. I wondered, did he really expect her to buy 30 new nightgowns? He asked for the receipts to reimburse her, so I guessed he was serious. I had no idea how I was going to handle that being as eager as I already was. I lay next to her. I'd almost forgotten how much you desire something when you know you can't have it. When Michelle and I abstained from being intimate with each other those three weeks before her date with Mike, it was on our own terms. We could have broken that vow of abstinence if we wanted to badly enough. This was going to be completely different since it was entirely out of our control. I knew that if we cheated and were intimate together, that Brett would never find out. Michelle and I would, though. She had given her word, and that was important to both of us. Sunday, Michelle insisted I go shopping with her in the mall. She dragged me to Victoria's Secret first. Michelle looked through their nightgowns, holding the ones she liked up to her body to get my opinion. Given that Brett's purpose was to make her eager for the next month, it added to the fun. I felt very aroused the whole time, thinking of her wearing a new nightie every night. She bought eight of the most beautiful ones she found. 
After Victoria's Secret, we went to the Bond March, Penny's, Maurice's, and some other stores, repeating the same process. At the end of the day, she'd bought 30 of the most beautiful 90s in the mall. Some were short and satin, several of the nicest were silk, some had bikini or thong panties that she likely wouldn't be wearing, and some were long, soft, and flowing. The one thing they all had in common was that they were beautiful. She didn't skimp on quality or pay any attention to how expensive they were, since she knew we'd be reimbursed for them all. Her only criteria was that they had to be beautiful. Altogether, they set our credit card back over $2,000. The next couple weeks turned into a difficult time for me. All I could think about was being intimate with my wife. She made it a point to be beautiful every day and wore another one of those beautiful nightgowns every night. We followed the rules religiously, never touching, never being intimate. It was challenging for me, but much harder for my dear wife since she was the one constantly wearing the beautiful clothes. We were a couple that had become accustomed to being intimate and physically close. Now it was all being taken away from us, while at the same time Michelle was dressing to drive both of us crazy. Thank goodness she wasn't working. I don't think her law office would have approved of her beautiful clothing. Two and a half weeks into our forced separation, Michelle told me at dinner that she had a surprise for me. I looked at her curiously, wondering what she was talking about. You have a date Friday. She's a girl I met at work. We had been having lunches together, and she mentioned her lack of a love life after her husband passed away last year. I told her a little bit about our open relationship and asked if she'd consider a date with my husband. You, what I stammered. I was looking at this unknown woman with my wide eyes. Well, I didn't actually make a date for you, but she said she'd love to this reminded me of the time my darling wife tricked me into spending a night with Jackie. Him, I thought. That hadn't turned out so badly, but then more rational thoughts took over. I didn't really want another relationship. Honey, I really don't want to. You're all I need. My wife is nothing if not persuasive, and she couldn't help but make me feel guilty. Sweetie, I'm going to be gone with another man for a month. I'm going to be having a good time, and I don't want to worry about you here by yourself the whole time. Please go out with her just once, and if you don't like her, I won't say another word. Then she went on, but I know you'll love her. She's fun and pretty then, she added with a smile on her face, and she's eager. And I know you are too, she was absolutely right about that last part. That was one thing I could certainly relate to at the moment. Every day, living and sleeping with a stunning partner and not being able to do anything about it had left me with a strong desire, almost constantly. My mind hadn't yet focused on what should have been obvious at the time. Could it be that Michelle was arranging a meeting with another woman in case she didn't come home? When we went to bed that night, Michelle wore the very beautiful gown of all the ones she'd bought. It was a short silk baby doll that was really similar to the silk dress she'd worn on our wedding night, except it was new, which made it even more attractive. It fit her perfectly. It was a night that I was incredibly eager. She showed it off to me and asked me to sleep with her. Then she got into bed with me, moved over, so our backs were touching, and we lay next to each other without touching, except for our backs. All this to convince me that I needed to go on a date with this girl she knew. Her body, all that soft skin, and her wonderful curves were just begging to be touched. I lay next to her, nearly in tears wanting her so much. I wanted so much to go to sleep and escape the torment of lying next to my stunning wife, unable to touch her. I don't know if I might have dozed off, but if so, it was very brief. In the morning, I called Diana, her friend. I introduced myself as Michelle's husband and asked her if she'd be free the coming Friday night. I needed some intimate female company. When she answered the phone, she had a very sweet-sounding, feminine voice and told me she'd love to have dinner with me. I'd have loved to call Ginger and spend the night with her, but I respected hers and Eric's decision that they'd need to initiate any fun and games between us. I couldn't help but daydream of the three nights I'd spent with her, though. Michelle was thrilled that I'd mustered up the courage to call Diana. She knew that my shyness around the opposite gender was deeply ingrained. Even though I'd had several very flirtatious encounters with a few ladies in the last couple of years and had realized that I was at least somewhat attractive to women, it was still a major accomplishment for me to call a woman I hadn't even met and ask her for a date. Michelle reassured me that our plan with Brett wasn't meant to make me feel overwhelmed with emotions, only her. 
She wanted me to have a fun evening with Diana and then a very enjoyable night. On Friday, I was extremely nervous. I had never done something like this before, except with Jackie, who I knew a little bit. Michelle had kept Diana a mystery, only telling me her name and that she was fun and vibrant. She didn't mention anything about Diana's appearance, age, or other personal details. It was a slow day at work, so I decided to leave half an hour early to give myself enough time to get ready. When I arrived home, I searched for Michelle and found her sitting on our bed, talking on the phone. She seemed unaware of my presence. I overheard her saying, yeah, I had a lot of fun too. It was quite an eventful night, wasn't it? I was curious about her conversation, so I quietly listened in. Did you see her afterwards? That's great. She's pretty, isn't she? I hope she appreciates your lovely lips as much as I do. I won't go into all the details of their conversation, but you can guess the general idea. It seemed like she was talking to Jeremy about a new girlfriend since her last date with him. It also sounded like more had happened on that date than Michelle had told me. My curiosity grew stronger, so I sat down on the bed next to her. She turned to me and greeted me. Oh, hi, honey. You're a little early this afternoon, then she went back to her phone call. Jeremy, sweetie, Robert just got home, so I have to go. She giggled. You too. Bye. After she ended the call, I asked her what the conversation was about. She replied, Oh, Jeremy was just telling me that he has a girlfriend. I'm really happy for him. What about the lips part? You never mentioned that after you came home from seeing him the other day. Did I forget? Well, he does have really nice, soft lips. The kind of lips a girl enjoys a thought crossed my mind, a mischievous one. I bet they felt good on your cheeks too, she closed her eyes and sighed, lost in her own thoughts. Em ha ha, I caught her. I thought you said nothing happened. His lips on your cheeks isn't exactly nothing happened, Michelle blushed, realizing that she had slipped up. Maybe I did leave some details out, she confessed. I looked into her eyes, only some she groaned and admitted. Maybe dot 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 more than I initially told you. You sound like you're asking me. Do you want to share everything with me now, honey? I really want to tell you everything. But can we do it at another time you made love with him? Right, she nodded. Yes. More than once her face grew redder as she nodded again. More than twice I asked. Affirmative nod once more. Three times still confirmed. This was becoming quite unbelievable. Four finally, a negative response. I wasn't entirely sure of what she had just revealed. So, you made love with him multiple times. Was it three times or four times she held up four fingers? I know what you're thinking when you read this, and I should be angry. She had lied to me. Honestly, though, my anger started to fade when she interrupted, Honey, what would you have done if I came home and told you all about how I made love with Jeremy multiple times? We couldn't do anything that night, and it would have driven you crazy. I planned on telling you everything at a better time than she corrected herself. Actually, it was only three times. One of them was with another girl at the party. The story was becoming even more interesting by the minute. I thought you said you didn't do anything with another girl. Oh no, not me. I was referring to when Jeremy kissed another girl at the party. You mean bashful, shy Jeremy kissed another girl well. It was just kissing this revelation shocked me. I always wanted to play strip poker with Michelle and others but she always declined. And what about my sweet, innocent wife? She nodded with affirmation. Well, it was strip poker, she explained. I raised my eyebrows as this story was becoming more incredulous by the second. Did you have any intimate encounters with another guy besides Jeremy? She shook her head no. I couldn't resist asking with another girl. No. Just with Jeremy? Then she whispered softly, more to herself than to me, I guess you could say I gave a guy a very good surprise. I guess that could be considered being intimate with another guy once. Oh no, I was about to explode. It had been over three weeks since I last had physical intimacy, and this conversation was affecting me exactly as she predicted. It was difficult to get any details from her, so I directly asked, anything else I should know? She shook her head no, but then added, well, Unless you count Jeremy getting intimate with me, I stared at her, shocked and almost choked on my own words. Unless I count that I stammered, well, yeah, I think that's more than a little significant. I didn't want that image in my mind on my first date with Diana tonight. Her face turned a bright shade of red. One more small thing, there's a video of it. 
Thank goodness I wasn't drinking anything at that moment otherwise. I would have spit it everywhere. She waited for me to calm down. It took a moment before I stopped sputtering. A video that someone else took. Yes, I didn't know he was filming. I was a bit preoccupied, she admitted. He sent it to Jeremy's phone afterwards once I managed to calm myself down, I asked. And what about the other three times? What happened then? Those were in my hotel room. We were still a little turned on, I muttered under my breath, mostly to myself in disbelief, still a little turned on. Michelle added, well, we had dinner at Shari's in between, but it didn't really calm us down, especially after Tanner sent the video to Jeremy's phone, I rolled my eyes. I'm sure you put on quite a show for everyone at Shari's. I think the waitress was jealous and excited by the time we left, she giggled. Actually, I was certain she was after we let her watch the video as much as I didn't want to. I knew we needed to end this conversation. I had a date that night, and I didn't want to be late. Michelle helped me get ready, picked out clothes for me, and gave me encouragement that Diana would like me. It was similar to how she supported me before my first date with Jackie, except for one thing. On that occasion, she left a lipstick mark on my cheek, hoping it would impress Jackie. This time, although I desired it, there was no lipstick mark. We didn't exchange any kisses or hugs as I left the house. We hadn't even hugged each other for almost three weeks. Our only physical contact had been accidentally brushing against each other in bed. I craved physical, intimate contact with a woman. Yet Michelle told me about her experiences with Jeremy, and I was going on a date with a lively girl I had never met. Thanks, Michelle. Just what I needed tonight. I remembered how I had bought Jackie flowers when I first picked her up, and how much she appreciated it. I stopped at a florist and picked out a bouquet of tulips and a nice vase. The salesperson arranged the tulips beautifully in the vase, ready for me to give to Diana. I hoped she would like them. I drove to the address Michelle had given me, feeling incredibly nervous. I stood in front of the door, contemplating whether I should run away. I took a deep breath, held onto the vase of flowers tightly, and rang the doorbell. I heard footsteps approaching the door, the doorknob turning, and then the door swung open. Standing in front of me was a stunning young woman. The first thing I noticed was her lovely face, like a pixie small nose, dimples on her cheeks, and vibrant glasses. The next thing I noticed was her height, maybe around 5A or 5 feet 3 inches. Then her face lit up with a warm smile. Her smile was contagious, and I instantly liked her. Hi Diana, I'm Robert I handed her the vase of tulips. She took the flowers with one hand and held my other hand with the other, leading me into her home. Thank you, I love tulips. How did you know I decided honesty would be the best policy? I didn't. I wanted something pretty for you and I thought they were beautiful, then she kissed me on my cheek. Her perfume smelled heavenly. She'd already put me at ease, relieving much of my nervousness. My initial reaction to her was that she seemed to be a fun, very happy person. I asked her if she'd like to accompany me to dinner and she said she'd love to. I followed her to my car, admittedly admiring the view. She had a very nice feminine figure. She was wearing a pair of slacks and a purple dress to contrast with her fair complexion and wavy, shoulder-length, brown hair. I opened the car door, letting her slide in. As I walked to my side of the car, I tried to figure out how old she might be. I suspected she was pretty close to my age, maybe a few years younger, probably in her 30s. I took her to my favorite restaurant, the Black Angus. We had a fantastic meal, and I loved talking with her. She told me about her husband, how he'd passed away a little over a year ago from cancer. I found it amazing that after such a tragedy she was such a happy person. I asked her about that. She told me, before he died, he told me he wanted me to enjoy my life. I could either feel sorry for myself or do what he'd asked. Yes, I miss him, but I'd rather honor him by enjoying life. What a brave, fantastic person I was sitting with, I thought. Everything she said made me like her more. Then she changed the subject. Did Michelle tell you I'm a pilot you mean an airplane pilot? No, she didn't. Are you serious? What kind of plane? I have a little two-seat Super Piper Cub. Would you like a ride sometime I couldn't help but grin? One of my biggest fantasies has always been to fly in a small plane. I'd absolutely love it. I've always wanted to do that. Is tomorrow too soon? I'd love to take you up my grin gave me away. I was thrilled and couldn't wait. I'm free, you name the time, how about if you meet me at my house around 8? 
It's so beautiful in the sky at sunset. Can I take you to dinner again? Maybe pick you up at six now it was her turn to grin. Sounds like a plan we spent the rest of the evening talking about various things. She told me how she came to have the pilot's license, something she'd always wanted to do. She said her husband had talked her into taking the lessons a few years ago, and she's enjoyed flying ever since. She bought the plane with her insurance money as a final gift from her husband. I was more than impressed at what an independent woman Diana was. When Michelle had told me that Diana was someone she'd met through work, she hadn't told me that Diana actually owned her own auditing business. She has four employees, including three other auditors and her office manager. We weren't sitting in Trisha's section, but Trisha had seen me and stopped at our table in a brief lull. I introduced Trisha to Diana, explaining to Diana that she was a longtime friend. Trisha said she and her husband had gone back together and thanked me and Michelle for prompting her to reach back out to him. I'd already heard that and told her how happy we both were for her. I think our conversation impressed Diana as she asked me how we'd helped her. I don't know. I guess maybe just showing her that she could put her problems with him in the right perspective, and to help her to realize she still loved him, it actually did feel pretty good that between Jackie, Michelle, and me, we'd helped bring a couple back together. Trisha and I had a lot of fun together, including finding out about her flying kitty cat a series of dreams she revealed when she'd been hypnotized at the Main Street show of the Pendleton Roundup, then again that night in our hotel room. I liked her a lot and was happy for her. We sat in the Black Angus talking until shortly after their closing at 11. Then we sat in the car and continued talking and learning about each other. We held hands, but I didn't want to go further than that until we got to know each other more. Jockey and I had slept together on our first date, then went through a dating process. Yes, I definitely wanted to sleep with Diana, but wanted to do it in the right order and when she was ready. We realized it was past midnight, and I drove her back to her house. At her front door, she didn't invite me in but told me what a wonderful evening she had. I told her I had too. Before I left, she kissed me. When she broke away, she seemed to make me a very nice promise. Tomorrow, she said. I told her how much I was looking forward to seeing her again. My heels felt like clicking together as I walked back to my car. I liked this girl a lot and knew it would be very easy to fall for her. I drove slowly toward home, making a few detours along the way and didn't get home until nearly 1 a.m. I couldn't have been more pleased with my first blind date. Michelle was still up, waiting for me. I wasn't sure why, since I knew she expected me to spend the night with Diana. As soon as I walked in, she asked me, well, how'd it go? Did you like her? I grinned at my Michelle. It was fantastic. You were right. She's a wonderful girl. She patted the couch next to her. Well, sit down and tell me about it. Let's go to bed first when she exited the bathroom wearing another one of her new nighties. I had to close my eyes for a little bit and gather my strength for what I was about to do. She looked so amazing and I was so excited. That kiss from Diana hadn't helped calm my feelings either. Oh, how I wanted to hold Michelle in my arms and be intimate with her. Usually when we related our stories to each other we did it while we were cuddling, adding immeasurably to our emotional connection. Diana and I had so much fun. We went to the Black Angus and sat in one of the back booths where we had privacy. We slid as far back as we could and I kissed her. Her lips are so silky soft, she kissed me back. I paused a little bit to let that image soak into Michelle's mind. I thought that at least the part about Diana's lips being so soft was true. I was already feeling aroused but my thoughts about those lips were making me even more excited and breathless. It reminded me of the time at the Black Angus when I was there with Michelle and Sean. Trisha had interrupted their romantic moment. I couldn't help but smile, as I remembered explaining to Trisha that I was Michelle's husband and Sean was her boyfriend. I went on, embellishing the truth a little more to Michelle. When the waiter brought our dinner, we couldn't take our eyes off each other. The only thing I wanted was to get back to her house I watched Michelle starting to rub her hands on her back and sway them slightly while she softly sighed. When we finally finished dinner and drove back to Diana's, we didn't make it past her couch until we were fumbling with our clothes and kissing I sighed, partly for effect and partly because the story I was telling was turning me on too. Her skin is so soft and my hands were all over her. Remember that first time you and Sean made love how you told me you started undressing as soon as you were in his house, and he was inside you almost before you were on the bed. That's how it was with me and Diana. 
Oh, honey. It felt so incredible when I entered her I continued with my little story. I could tell when Diana's pleasure hit her. It had been a year since she had been intimate with someone, and she's definitely expressive Michelle's hips were writhing, and her head was rolling back and forth. I held her hand so she couldn't touch herself. She finally said something meaningful, honey, please let me enjoy myself. T Just once did you know Diana is a pilot and owns her own airplane? What? No, oh my goodness, I was still holding Michelle's hands away from her. She's going to take me up tomorrow after I take her to dinner again. Oh, by the way, everything I just told you. None of it happened. We just talked the whole evening. Michelle's eyes popped open and she looked straight at me. You trickster. her. You did that on purpose. I couldn't help but chuckle. Yep, I did. And it was so much fun. Now, go to sleep the next morning. Michelle was a little distant with me. I was in the kitchen with my morning iced tea reading my Kindle when she walked in wearing the same nightgown. Her hair was a mess, no makeup. She looked so attractive. She went to the refrigerator for the milk, then poured herself a bowl of vanilla almond cereal without even looking at me. She finally looked at me and I was glad to see a smile start to form on her face. I have to admit that last night was kind of fun. You're pretty convincing with your stories. You know she really is a pilot and has a plane, a piper cub. You didn't know that. No, she never mentioned it to me watching my wife dressed like that made having a normal conversation with her very difficult. My excitement started to build in me. Naturally, Michelle noticed, looks like someone's starting to wake up this morning. Yeah, it's kind hard not to. The way you're dressed, I know how I could help you. But you know about the no-touching rule now, the flirting was definitely on the other foot. I think I better get dressed. I got up and was walking down the hall to our bedroom when I heard Michelle behind me. I'm just going to wear this for a while. I'm so comfortable. Oh, how I was looking forward to my date with Diana that evening. My wife was driving me to total distraction. It was a nice warm day and the grass was getting tall, so I figured what better way to kill some time and use up a little energy than mowing the lawn. I pulled the mower out of the garage and started with the front yard. When I moved to the back, the view was a little distracting. Michelle had changed into one of her bathing suits and was sunning herself on our back deck. I finished a little after two and joined Michelle with a glass of iced tea and a tuna fish sandwich she'd made. It was a little hard to avert my eyes from her attractive body, and she enjoyed me looking leering was more accurate. I didn't even try to disguise my admiration. She asked about my date that evening, and I told her we're going to dinner, then Diana's taking me up in her plane. And after that, I'm hoping she'll invite me in. If so, I might not make it home tonight you liked her then. Ha, huh, yeah, I think I could learn to like her a lot. She's amazing. How anyone can be as fun-loving and happy after losing her husband only a year ago is incredible. She's never told me very much about her husband, apparently. Before he passed away, he told her he wanted her to enjoy the rest of her life, so she's determined to do it, I'm glad. I really like her, and I was sure you would too. I guess I have to tell you, thank you for the blind date, you're welcome. I'll enjoy my cruise that much more knowing you're with someone nice. Then she added, if you're not coming home tonight, I think I'll spend the night with Sean. I squinted my eyes at her a little bit. I'm not certain about spending the night, but I don't mind if you go to Sean's. Does he know about the no-touching rule? You know he's going to try to be intimate with you, don't you? Can you be trusted with him? Yes, dear. I can be trusted you weren't very trustworthy last night. Were you that's because you were intentionally teasing me and Sean's going to be intentionally trying to be intimate with you? Can you stop him when you're going to want it as bad or worse? Sweetheart, I know I can't be intimate with him, okay? I trust you. What are you going to wear with him? I have clothes there, and I'll take one of the new 90s. I want to pick one out for you to wear with him. I went to the drawer where she was keeping the new ones she hadn't worn yet. Just handling them was driving me crazy. There was one in particular I was looking for, one of the ones I especially liked from Victoria's Secret. It was another baby doll satin, but with a lacy, totally see-through bodice. I knew that Sean would be driven completely to distraction, and he wouldn't be able to keep his hands off her. Likewise, Michelle would be completely out of her mind with wanting Sean. I held it out to her, that's the one. If you go to Sean's, I want you to wear this one. And while Sean and I are suffering, you'll be with my friend. Okay, that's fair. Nothing fair about it. You said yourself that this isn't about me, it's about making you as excited as possible. I'm just trying to do what you said. 
Besides, you're the one who insisted I go out with Diana. When you're with Sean, I want you to be thinking about what Diana and I are doing Michelle's side. Okay, I'll wear it good. Now that that's settled, if it's okay with Diana, I'll send you some pictures, maybe even a video tonight. I couldn't help but tease her a little after what she'd done to me when she was with Sean in Las Vegas. I got playfully hit on my arm just for trying to be helpful. The girl has no sense of justice. She got up and went in the house. I followed behind her, admiring the view with my excitement already strong from the conversation we'd just been having. I thought I needed to tease her just a little more, um, sweetheart. Don't forget there's also a no-pants rule when you go out with him. She turned, getting a playful smile on her face. In her best dancer pose, she slipped her hands under the strings of her dress. Then she reached behind her and pulled the little knot holding her top in place. Her top dropped away, leaving my gorgeous wife standing in front of me. Do you think Brett will enjoy the view when we're in his room, she asked me. There's no need to elaborate on how my mind and body responded to that. I think you get the idea. I couldn't help but tell her, and I hope Sean gets the same view tonight. Later that afternoon, Michelle left for Sean's. She said they were going out to dinner at the Branding Iron nightclub. We've never been there, but I checked their YouTube page, and they were having a country western singer for entertainment. I talked her into wearing one of the western outfits she'd bought for a long weekend with Sean shortly after they started seeing each other. It was a short leather skirt and red silk blouse. It was attractive as heck. Michelle hadn't seen her lover in almost two weeks and hadn't had any intimate time for almost four weeks. Now she was going to a nightclub with him wearing extremely attractive clothes, then back to his house to sleep with him in one of her best dresses dot dot dot, and they couldn't touch each other. How incredibly delightful can you get? Either one of two things was going to happen she'd be awake and miserably excited all night, or would give in and have a good time. Either way, I was anxious to hear about her night. I really hoped she'd keep her word and save the good time for Brett, which I was about 95% certain she'd do. Besides, I was looking forward to teasing her for the next week and a half. I was hoping that after sleeping with Diana, my intimate desires would be at least somewhat mollified, leaving me free to happily tease my wife. After Michelle left, I got myself ready for my date with Diana. I had no idea what kind of restaurant she wanted to go so decided to dress for the plane trip. A simple pair of slacks and one of my favorite satiny shirts. I loved the feel of a woman's hand on that shirt, and I was hoping to feel Diana's hands on it later. When I met her at her house, I was again taken aback by her big smile. Diana isn't beautiful like my Michelle, but she's very pretty in a girl next door kind of way. She was wearing a simple pair of slacks and a loose-fitting top that didn't reveal any details about her body. She suggested she drive since she knew where the airport was and had an excellent restaurant in mind where she'd been wanting to go for quite some time. The McDonald's drive through wasn't exactly what I presumed she had in mind, but I couldn't help but laugh a little when she pulled up to the speaker and asked me what I wanted. We ordered and drove to Riverfront Park on the Columbia River. She found a secluded spot to park, and we sat in the car eating our dinner and talking. Diana told me more about her husband, Phil, and how he'd become ill with brain cancer. After it was diagnosed, the doctor told them he likely only had a few months left. She told me that after the initial shock and tears, they talked for hours and hours about what he wanted for her after he was gone. She said she's never talked to anyone about that time in their life before. I felt pretty honored that she trusted me with such an intimate and painful part of her life. I learned she was the youngest of her family, she has an older brother and sister, and that she was raised in Moses Lake her mom was an elementary school teacher, now retired, and her dad is an auditor. She told me she and her husband were so engrossed in their businesses that they hadn't had the initiative for a baby, and how much she regretted that decision now. I told her I'd never met anyone like her either. I couldn't help but think that someone who's had such a recent heartbreak and was now so happy is a unique person. The more I got to know about her, the more I liked the sound of her name, Diana. Speaking of happy, Diana finally drove us to the airport and we walked to her plane. To say I was impressed is a monumental understatement. Her plane was beautiful white with fiery red striping on the body and wings and polished to a gleam. From the look on Diana's face, I could tell how proud she was of it. I thought she might kiss it. Every time I see this, I think of Phil. 
He gave it to me, she explained. Diana untethered the straps that held the wings down, then opened the door on one side and gestured for me to climb in. I did so, and she climbed in on the other side, then went through her pre-flight checklist one by one, including making sure both of us were belted in. She enumerated them and voiced each one out loud, but I was excited and can't remember them. When she was ready, she hit the starter button and her engine came to life. She looked over at me with a smile on her face and commented, isn't that a sweet sound? I gave her a thumbs up and she gave it a little push. We started to move, rolling to the end of a runway. After a short pause, she pushed the throttle forward, pushing us back against the seats. It seemed only a tiny way until it lifted off the runway and we were actually flying. We gained elevation pretty quickly until she leveled it off and let off the throttle a little. It made a huge difference as we could now talk and hear each other. She told me that she listened to the radio just in case, but didn't need to communicate with the big airport's tower unless something happened. I was fascinated and loved looking down on the town I'd lived in for so long but had never seen from above. It's funny how you can see things you have seen before, but see them for the first time in a new light, like how all the streets interconnected with each other. She flew us over both our houses so I could see it from above, then she started north. I was loving it. I'd never dreamed that flying could be so much fun. Well, actually I had, but it was only in my imagination before. Now I was experiencing the real thing, and it was every bit as much fun as I'd hoped it'd be even more. I remember watching the flying scene in It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World with the cars below driving about double the speed of the old airplane, but this certainly wasn't like that. We were zipping past the cars. Diana told me some of the details of her plane, but I was so engrossed in the scenery and excitement that I don't remember a word of what she said about it, other than her excitement and love for her plane and flying. We flew for about an hour north, over Dry Falls. Michelle and I had been there a few years before. It's where the ancient Ice Age Missoula floods had washed out a gigantic waterfall area about four times bigger and over twice as deep as Niagara. She flew down lower so we could see the tiny trickle of a stream in the bottom with people fishing. Even all the water that flows over Niagara wouldn't make much more than a trickle. During the flooding when it was formed, it was completely underwater, not much more than a ripple in the giant flow. The floods were a result of ice dams during the last ice age in what's now Montana that built up over 40 to 50 year periods, then broke. They've estimated that the water flow would have been equal to approximately 10 times the flow of all the world's rivers combined. It's truly fascinating. Look up Dry Falls, Washington on Google. Seeing it from the air was magnificent. She turned around and we went home over a different route, past Moses Lake and the potholes areas. That's where the floods gouged out little potholes up to a mile or so in diameter and several hundred feet deep. Still, they were tiny in comparison to Dry Falls. On the way home, she asked me if I'd like to fly her plane. I looked at her a little askance, and she assured me it'd be okay. She showed me how to control the plane and let me use the wheel, not really a wheel, but I don't know for sure how to describe it. It was incredibly exciting. I tilted one way than the other several times, flying higher and lower over and over again. I could certainly understand why Diana was so excited about her flying. When she decided it was time to return to the airport, she took the control away from me. Darn, I wanted to land it. Maybe it was just as well I didn't. It did look a bit more complicated than going up and down or back and forth. Plus the minor fact that with her doing it, we'd actually stay safe. After we landed and rolled to a stop at her little garage area, she shut down the engine and went through another checklist that was embedded in her mind. She said she'd come out the next day and refuel it. Diana was quiet on our way back to her house. Her house was beautiful. It's two stories with a big yard in one of the nicer neighborhoods of Richland set fairly high on a hill where it overlooks the town and the Columbia River. She has a big picture window in her living room with a magnificent view of the river. I could tell she was nervous, definitely not the confident woman she'd been in her plane a short while ago. She showed me her kitchen and asked if I'd like something to drink. I told her I'm not much of a drinker, but maybe a glass of iced tea would be good if she had it. She laughed a little and said, I think I have something better than that. 
She went to the kitchen and poured some fruit juice, orange juice and ice into her blender. It's whipped cream juice. Mixed like this, it tastes like the fruity ice cream we used to get when we were kids. It actually did taste good, and just like she said, like the mixed fruity ice cream. We sat on her couch, at opposite ends. Her hands were shaking when she drank, so I told her, Diana, it's okay, we don't have to do anything else tonight. No, I really want to. It's just that it's been so long, and I'm a little scared I think I understood what she was thinking. I remembered my first time with Jackie, how scared I'd been that night, but also how good it had turned out. Do you want to just sit and talk a while? Maybe tell me a little more about Phil. She closed her eyes like she was trying to remember. We met in college at Oregon State. We were both taking a business class. I guess it was pretty typical, girl meets boy, girl falls in love. We were kids, it was winter, we dated the rest of the semester. When I went home for spring break, I realized how much I missed him. She paused a little bit, and when she started talking again, it was barely a whisper. The first time we kissed, it was March in Corvallis. It's so pretty there in the early spring that we just took a walk through the park and held hands. We sat on a bench with the moon shining on us. She laughed a little. It seems like such a cliche, but it was special to us. He kissed me and asked if I wanted to go back to his apartment with him. How could I say no when I wanted to so badly? We made love that night. It was the most special night of my life I couldn't take my eyes away from Diana as she told me her story. I think she was very close to tears, remembering and telling me about something so special to her. We got married that summer and our happiness never died down she wiped her eyes a little until Phil got sick. We went to the doctor with his headaches and after some tests, he gave us the news, brain cancer. It was too far gone, inoperable. I scooted over to her and held her hand. She wasn't crying but was very close. It was four months. He was in and out of the hospital but all they could do was control his pain a little. Before he died, he told me he wanted me to be happy. He died in his hospital bed a little over a year ago. I wanted to bring him home but he refused. He said he didn't want me to remember our house that way. He wanted me to remember all the happy times instead. I was sitting next to Diana holding her hand totally amazed at what she'd gone through and what a strong woman she was. She took another drink, smiled and asked me, what about you? How did you and Michelle meet? What could I say after the heartbreaking story she'd just told me? Diana was smiling again and acted like she really wanted to know, so I told her about meeting Michelle at a basketball game while I was home on leave from the Coast Guard for my grandma's funeral. I loved my grandma and always felt that I owed her everything. I'd never have gone out with Michelle or had the life I have if it wasn't for her I told her about our first date after the game. We were going to a movie when one of us mentioned how much we liked the mountains at that time of year. We both laughed, and I turned the car around to borrow my dad's four-wheel drive Toyota Land Cruiser, and we spent the evening playing in the snow instead of watching a boring movie. We dated until I left for New York and the Coast Guard, then wrote letters each other every day. After radio school, the I was stationed at a small, secluded station in Sitkinak, Alaska for a year's tour of duty. I still remember that airplane trip when I left her, thinking it'd be a whole year before I saw her again. I told her about the lake at the base, how the mail plane would land on the lake, then quite often the wind would shift directions. With the wind blowing the wrong way, they couldn't take off along the length of the lake, so they did the short direction dot 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 straight into a fairly tall bluff at the edge. With the wind, the plane would get in front of the bluff and literally lift like a helicopter to clear the bluff. She laughed and said she'd have hated to be the first one to try that little maneuver. Then, unexpectedly, they transferred me to Kodiak at four months. I went home on two weeks' leave, and we got married in Reno. I went back to Kodiak, found us a tiny apartment, and a couple weeks later, she flew there to meet me. Diana looked at me a little quizzically. Why are you here with me? I don't understand. I know you love Michelle, so why did she set up a date between us? I took a deep breath. How the heck do I explain our situation? Michelle told me that she told you a little about our open relationship. It's such a long story. It started in Kodiak when we had a rather eventful night with her spending time with another guy. I discovered that night I was kind of a voyeur and liked her being with someone else. We never did. Anything like that again until a couple years ago. 
She told me about a lover she had in college, and to make a long story short, I encouraged her to meet him again for a weekend alone Diana's eyes were wide, totally engrossed in the story I was telling her. Michelle knew how nervous I was with girls, and hadn't ever been with anyone but her. I told her about the sales girl at Victoria's Secret when I was buying her clothes for her date, so she literally dragged me there and forced me to ask her for a date. Diana's face had lost that sadness from earlier and was grinning ear to ear. Did you spend time with her, M? But not until after watching Michelle spend time with her boyfriend that night that got a huge giggle from Diana. And it was so perfect. It was the first time I'd even kissed another girl. I'd never imagined what it could be like did you see her again after that. We had a special friendship for about a year until she moved away last year, but we stayed close friends. She just got married not long ago. Michelle was one of her bridesmaids, was that difficult for you? Seeing your friend marry another man, I took a moment to think back to that day before responding. It was. I have to admit that I still had feelings for her. However, we knew from the beginning that we could never be together. I was happy to see her so joyful with her husband. I think we will always remain close friends. Is Michelle still dating the guy from college? No. They dated for a few months, but he became too serious and wanted her to leave me and move in with him. I paused, unsure of how much more to share. With a smile, I added, she's now seeing someone new who she absolutely adores. Are you afraid she will leave you? Sometimes it does worry me a bit. It's a little unconventional, I suppose. I enjoy her having friendships with other guys, and the uncertainty makes it more thrilling. I could see her thoughtful expression. I could never do that. I couldn't stand seeing my partner with someone else. But I can see how it could be exciting she then asked me, where is Michelle now? She's spending the night with her boyfriend. I didn't mention that she would soon be going on a month-long trip with a very wealthy and attractive guy. Diana looked deeply into my eyes, and it felt as though I could peer into her soul. I had never met someone quite like her before. She softly asked, will you give me a hug? I was already beside her, still holding her hand. I leaned in, and she mimicked my movement, closing her eyes as we hugged. Her lips were tender, and I slightly tilted my head so that we wouldn't bump noses. After a while, she reluctantly pulled away, her eyes still closed, and whispered, let's show our affection. I was elated. I desired her so intensely. Are you sure, please? I want to feel loved again. She got out from under me, took my hand, and led me up the stairs to her bedroom. Once inside, we hugged again. I guided her in front of her dresser mirror, turned her around so she faced away from me, and began helping her with clothes. Her hands trembled as she helped me unbutton it. When her blouse was open, I carefully helped her remove it. Standing in front of the mirror, I wrapped my arms around Diana as she stood there. You are beautiful, I whispered to her. Diana unsnapped her jeans and slid them down. I couldn't resist caressing them with my fingers, feeling the softness and the firmness of her body. Diana let out a soft noise, and her fingers intertwined with mine as we got intimate. She turned around, her fingers trembling, as she started unbuttoning my shirt. I began at the bottom, and she started at the top. When she opened my shirt, she hugged me, driving me wild. My hands trembled as I struggled to undo the button of my pants. Eventually, I managed to push them and my boxers down. That night we got close to each other and got intimate. We had a great time, better than I had expected. We fell asleep cuddling each other. I was thanking my wife for that beautiful night. Afterward, we were both sweaty and warm. We lay on top of the covers, holding each other. The next morning, I woke up to find Diana looking at me, tears streaming down her face. Instantly, I was wide awake. I gently wiped away her tears with my fingers and asked her what was wrong. She sniffled, the tears making it difficult for her to speak. I can't do this. Last night was incredible, but I can't love a man knowing he isn't mine. I thought I could, but it's too painful I was at a loss for words. I felt incredibly small, maybe even smaller. All I could manage to say was, I'm sorry she placed her finger on my lips. No, don't be. You showed me that I can love again. You gave me a beautiful night. Tears welled up in my eyes as well. But I can't do it again. Then her expression brightened a bit. Can we still be friends though? I would love to take you flying again. We just can't do. That again. I smiled at her, unsure if we could truly be just friends. It seemed unlikely, but I told her I would like that. 
you are an amazing woman. Someone is going to be very fortunate. Can I make you some breakfast? She wore her dress to make breakfast. We talked about many other things. She shared stories about her adventures purchasing the plane and the places she had visited. I couldn't help but think about how much more she would enjoy those experiences with someone she loved to share them with. After breakfast, I kissed her on the cheek, expressed my gratitude for the flight and the incredible evening, and then left. I couldn't help but bask in the beauty of Diana's character. Before leaving, I asked if she could do me a favor. If you happen to speak to Michelle, please don't mention that we won't be intimate anymore. I want her to believe that we are still together. She grinned mischievously and playfully swatted my behind. Naughty man. Okay, for Michelle's sake, we are passionately in love and will spend every moment possible together. I grinned back at her. Thank you. I will explain it to you later. When I arrived home, Michelle hadn't returned yet. I secretly hoped that she had a restless and frustrating night with Sean. Perhaps it was a cruel desire on my part. I had one more week to tease her, and I wanted to take advantage of it. I think my intention was to distract myself from what could have been with Diana. I knew I couldn't leave Michelle for her, but we could have had so much fun. As I pottered around the house, waiting for Michelle, my thoughts kept drifting back to Diana and what I could do for her, if anything. One particular idea entered my mind and lingered, insisting to be contemplated further before taking any action. Finally, Michelle arrived home around 9 in the evening. She shared that they had both slept in, taken a drive, and enjoyed a nice dinner. I was mostly curious about what they had done the previous night, so I asked her, How was your night? Did you wear the nightgown? She blushed slightly, her face turning red. No, she replied. I gave her a stern look, pretending to reprimand her, but her expression quickly changed as she added, neither of us wore anything. We knew it was off limits. We spent the whole night in bed with the lights on, just looking at each other and longing to make love. But we didn't even touch. Neither of us fell asleep until early this morning she then inquired, what about you and Diana? I wanted to tell her every intimate detail just to make her squirm a little more. Well, almost everything. I wasn't going to reveal to her that Diana and I wouldn't be seeing each other anymore. I knew part of Michelle's plan was to keep me occupied while she was away with Brett for a month. She would savor her time with him even more if she thought I was in the capable hands of Diana Fulbright. I wasn't going to burst that bubble and dampen her excitement. When bedtime came, I suggested to Michelle that she wear the black teddy from Maurice's. I wanted romance to be the foremost thing on her mind when I was telling her about my night with Diana. Usually, when we tell each other our love tales, we do it while we're cuddling. After the incredible time I'd had the night before, I knew I could be much more detailed with her without it bothering me nearly as much as her. She'd made it a point to put on her nice perfume and makeup before she came to bed. She looked so incredible, I wasn't sure if I could do what I'd planned. My carefully thought out intentions and assumption went straight out the window when that wonderful creature climbed into bed beside me. I rolled onto my side facing her and ran through her hair. This was going to be such fun. I couldn't touch her intimately, but I thought I could teasingly touch her while I told her about how amazing it had been with Diana. Diana's a sweet girl. How long have you known her, I asked. I knew her a couple months. She looked lonesome when she came into our office, so I asked her if she'd like to do lunch together. We've been friends since then. Did you ever notice how soft her lips are? I closed my eyes and ran my fingertip over Michelle's lips. Never mind. You probably don't want to know how soft her lips were and how wonderful it felt when our lips met. Did you know that last night was her first time in over a year? It reminded me of that night with you and Alec when he hadn't been with a person for so long. That was a fun night. Didn't you think so? You know, it's only been about a month since you've been intimate. Imagine what it was like for Diana. Over a year, Michelle was enjoying every bit of the story I was telling her. It looked like the story I was telling satisfied her in ways. I'm curious, sweetheart, when you had an intimate moment with Brett, did you hug him? Michelle was holding her legs tightly together and groaned in response. Last night when you were at the branding iron, I bet every guy there wanted to see your body. Did it drive Sean crazy that he couldn't see it last night? I know it's driving me crazy right now. I want so badly to pull your little teddy up and kiss you all over. I'm sorry I got distracted. I was telling you about Diana, how good her body is. She seemed to like it too with her hands in my hair pushing my mouth tighter around them. 
After we were both intimate and on her bed, we spent some more time. Her bare body against my chest felt so good. I made it a point to tell her how beautiful she is while we explored each other's bodies with our hands. Her skin is so soft. I loved feeling her bottom, her nice smooth tummy and back. I think she enjoyed it too. My heart was pounding from telling all of this to Michelle. I wanted to make love with her so badly. After I finished and Michelle was whimpering next to me, I told her, now it's your turn. Tell me about your evening with Sean. She looked up from the pillow she was clawing at, took it in her hands and beat me all around my head and shoulders. When she assumed I was properly chastised, she buried her head in it and whimpered a little more. I guess she was through with the storytelling for the night. The rest of the week was stressful as Michelle was leaving the following Sunday morning. Every night was a challenge to get through because we were both so highly aroused. I told Michelle quite a bit more about my evening with Diana, including the adventure she took me on. I fibbed a little when I told her I expected to see a lot of Diana while she was gone. Thursday, Michelle went to dinner with Sean one last time to say goodbye to him but came home afterward. Saturday, I suggested she wear something nice, like maybe her Christmas dress, to go out to dinner and maybe dancing or something afterward. Michelle looked absolutely gorgeous when she was ready. Her dress is a turquoise leather with Indian beadwork that came to about mid-thigh. It's very form-flattering and attractive. She'd only worn it a couple times since I gave it to her as a Christmas present. The last time was the dorm dance with Jeremy. That had apparently turned into a pretty spectacular night dot 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 the last time she'd been intimate. I looked at my beautiful wife and couldn't imagine how I was going to survive a month with her gone. We went to our favorite restaurant, the Black Angus. I hoped Trisha was still working. She's the pretty waitress that I had a brief connection with last summer and fall until she went back to her husband. That time of the evening you nearly always have to sign in and wait for a table. When I did, I asked if Trisha was working. She was, so I asked if we could be seated in her section. The hostess told us it'd take a little longer, but it was worth the wait to Michelle and me. She really liked Trisha too. They give you these little light thingies to let you know when your table's ready. We waited in the lobby for about a half hour or so until our light flashed. The hostess seated us and Trisha got a big smile on her face when she saw us and asked what we'd like to drink. She told Michelle how beautiful her dress was, so Michelle had to scoot back out of the booth and model it for her. I was beaming, proud of myself for finding and buying it. Every time Trisha came to our table, we talked a little. Michelle told her that she was going to be taking a vacation to visit friends and planned to be gone quite a while. I suggested to Trisha that after Michelle got home, we'd love to have her and her husband to dinner some night. No, I didn't have any ulterior motive like seducing Trisha again. I just thought that since we'd been partially responsible for them getting back together, it would be nice to get to know them both a little more. We'd never met him. Trisha beamed and thought it sounded like a wonderful idea. We had a wonderful dinner. Michelle had a chicken salad with blue cheese dressing, uck, and I had a wonderful ribeye steak. Our food was good, the atmosphere was fantastic, and we had a wonderful waitress. What more can you ask for in a nice last dinner with your wife? I left out the part about my longing glances toward her all evening. Realizing that this would be our last dinner together for a month certainly put a damper on the evening. When we left, I had intended to take her to the Honey Buns Exotic Dance Club for the rest of the evening. I knew it'd be the ultimate turn-on for her. In the end, I couldn't do that, though. The time for teasing had passed. That night was the real thing, the last time I'd see her for the next month. The last time we'd sleep together for a long, long time. When we went to bed, Michelle wore the nightie that I thought she was going to wear with Sean that night, the best one she'd bought. We lay in bed, just looking at each other most of the night. I was very nearly in tears from wanting to hold her and caress her so badly, much less make love with her that last time. Emotionally, it reminded me a lot of my last night with Jackie before she left for Montana. The big difference was that Jackie and I had made love several times during the night. Our last day together was horrible. I felt like crying almost constantly but tried not to show it. We slept until late morning, then I made her sourdough waffles for breakfast. It seemed like we'd barely finished eating when it was time for us to go to the airport. Her flight left Pasco at 2.15 in the afternoon. The first leg was to Seattle, then a three-hour layover until her six-hour flight to Miami. 
We drove to the airport in silence, both of us lost in thoughts about the month ahead. I knew I could trust my wife, but this trip was more than either of us had ever imagined. I parked the car in the short-term parking lot and went to the trunk to retrieve her luggage. It wasn't until I'd opened the trunk that I remembered there was no luggage. Nothing at all, except the clothes she was wearing in her purse. I wish I could say we walked through the terminal, holding hands with our fingers intertwined, but we were still bound by that agreement we made. We hadn't even held hands for the past month and we couldn't break it then, even though I craved the physical connection with her. Teasing her had been fun, but the past month had been incredibly challenging and I knew the next one wouldn't be any easier. The Pasco airport is smaller compared to others, but the security rules are still strict. She had to check in early and after going through the metal detector, we couldn't be together while she waited for her flight. We stood in front of it for a few minutes, gazing into each other's eyes with tears streaming down our faces. I love you, I told her. She wiped her cheek and replied, you too, I'll call you when I get to the hotel. We couldn't even embrace. Michelle turned and joined the short line for security check. I watched her go through the metal detector without any problems. She turned back towards me and we blew air kisses at each other before she disappeared into the gate waiting area. The ride back home from the airport felt like the longest 12 miles I've ever traveled. The house felt cold and empty when I arrived. I sat on the couch for a good hour, staring at the television, even though it wasn't turned on. It didn't really matter. It was just the noise in an empty house. I had no idea how I would cope with this for a month, especially knowing that my wife would be spending that month with another person. She called me during her layover in Seattle. I've never heard a voice so sweet. I don't remember what we talked about. It didn't matter. All I needed was to hear her voice. We were on the phone for about 45 minutes until she mentioned that her phone was dying and she needed to find something to eat. I wandered around the house and eventually drove myself to McDonald's to get something to eat. She wasn't scheduled to arrive at the hotel until around 3 in the morning. I turned on the TV in the bedroom and climbed into bed, hoping to get some rest. Unfortunately, sleep eluded me as the hours slowly ticked away. I kept my phone in my hand, hoping she would find an opportunity to call, even though I knew she wouldn't be able to from the plane. Finally, at 3.15 in the morning, Michelle called again. She said she was at the hotel check-in counter. She didn't have to find a taxi as Brett had a car waiting for her. They went to the hotel together, which she said was near the airport. I lied to her, telling her I was fine and that I had been sleeping before she called. She said she managed to sleep a little on the plane, although I suspected she probably wasn't telling the truth either. We spoke for a few minutes until she had to check in. We both knew this would be our last conversation, so tears were flowing freely from both of us as we said goodbye and hung up. After I ended the call and lay there for another minute, realizing that I wouldn't hear from her for another month, I knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't let her go with him, money be forgotten. We could reimburse Brett for his flight expenses, but I needed her to come home. The realization hit me that I might never see my wife again. I had tried to convince myself of how much I trusted her, and I did, but this was too much. Fear washed over me suddenly, knocking some sense into me. It couldn't have been more than two minutes after we spoke that I called her back, urging her to come home tomorrow. Unfortunately, her phone went straight to voicemail, and I realized she must have given up her phone at the hotel. Panic surged through me. I knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't let her go through with it. I rushed to my desk, trembling, and looked up the phone number for the Hyatt in Miami. There was only one. My fingers shook as I dialed the number, full of panic. It took me three attempts to finally get the number right. A friendly female voice answered, Hyatt Place, Miami, how can I assist you? Undoubtedly, my panic was evident in my voice as I blurted out, There is a woman checking in right now, Michelle Fields. I need to speak with her, please I apologize, sir, but there is no one here by that name. My hands continued to shake, my voice broke, and tears streamed down my face as I responded. Then I don't know what name she might be using, perhaps Amber, but please, I have to talk to her, sir. I'm sorry, but there is nothing I can do to help you. The friendly voice had transformed into a firmer tone. Our instructions are clear that she is not to receive any calls with that. She ended the call. I stared at my phone in disbelief. I was too late. 
I had just been told that there was no way for me to contact her. My wife was gone. Panic consumed me completely, and there was absolutely nothing I could do. I felt complete hopelessness like never before. It took me a long time to catch my breath as I realized I was utterly powerless. If you're lost in the woods and filled with fear, at least you can run and try to find your way out. But there wasn't a single thing I could do. There was nowhere to run or hide from my emotions. The sudden realization that this fear would consume me for the next month was almost too much to bear. 